What's going on here? Okay, welcome. Uh, I am starting off by again reminding you of something that's actually earth shattering and it's changed our country and so few people know about it. It's a shame, but there's work underway to change that. That'll be how this whole meeting ends and there's a flyer about it outside here. Um, so this year the Supreme Court decided they were going to change our history from ever since we started and change the fact that patents used to be property rights. Meaning you owned it. You do whatever you want. It's your personal property. Meaning you can eat it, bury it, burn it, sell it, license it, make something out of it. The whole point it was yours. You created it. And Supreme and that was Article One, Section Eight of the Constitution, because our forefathers saw it. And that's a great way to get this country going is let people have the rights to their ideas and prosper. So uh, no Supreme Court decided no, that's not the case anymore. It's actually a grant involving public rights and it's the grant of a public franchise and that all the things that the patent office has been doing to take away patents is totally legal and they should go ahead and keep doing it. So mm -hmm. I'm starting off the meeting saying this and we're going to end the meeting by showing, uh, one, we disagree, and two, the uh, big things that are in the works to change this. Just because the Supreme Court decided something doesn't mean the other two divisions of the government are going to go along with it. So with that said, back to our regularly scheduled program. Welcome to the San Diego Renners <laughs> Our supporters are, uh, let me give Amen here a big hand. Thank you, thank you. And now here's a little bit of news. Uh, I, I, I'm so appreciative. Rod Weiss for years has allowed us uh, space at Coleman University to run our contest, which by the way is coming up in a couple months. Um, the unfortunate news is they closed their doors August 5th. They close their doors. There's some new changes now having to do with how veterans can apply for benefits and how, anyway, it turned into something that affected their bottom line so drastic they couldn't uh, recoup the loss of the business that they were suffering. So, you know, nature abhors a vacuum. We'll see. I think some of the head uh, teachers actually get together and start their own little group, especially there's been a robotics and a drone division there that has been doing some really great work teaching kids how to make uh, unmanned vehicles and drones and that in itself really needs to continue so I'm, I'm really hoping that core group will will continue um, that's what Dan Wolfson has been involved with and, you know, Dan, and I hope I hope we'll continue that move that forwards but anyway look for the times that they did help us out thank you so much Coleman. That's great. we are getting this on video so eventually you guys will see it to Leslie, who checked us in and is our speaker tonight. Thank you very much, Leslie. And I have actually asked because once or twice before, Jack in the Box availed us some space and room to hold our contest. So we'll see. We'll see. Uh, I am one of the bigger sponsors, A Square Technologies. You're very welcome. I'll brag about all what I've done here. <laughs> Thank you. David's not here tonight, uh, but he's a, a silver sponsor. He's been our resident patent agent and is just a, a charm to work with. Uh, uh, one of us here, Bob Green, his father or his grandfather actually invented blister packaging. So he's second, third generation doing blister packs. Those clamshells, if you hate to open, but they're so necessary. And so his shop is here and he's been a sponsor of ours. Uh, so these are all good guys, good to work with. This guy writes the book on do-it-yourself business plans and marketing plans and so on. So. Very inexpensive, uh, do-it-yourself stuff that we call uh, business power tools. Um, we wouldn't be here if it wasn't for contributors. They're not here every month, but collectively they make the year what it is, and it's really great. Um, you've seen some of these people. They're authors, they're writers. Our own Darren Michelle uh, is an often writer contributor here and on our board. Really happy to say. Uh, Dear Ben has uh, decided to retire. Um, ben Gage, his mother was Esther Williams. So he was introduced to the entertainment industry really early. Became an entertainment attorney, then became a patent attorney. Uh, he was working with Tony Robbins, doing his legal work, when Tony was still in his garage. Uh, you guys remember the Floby hair thing? Yeah, absolutely. And the, some of those early, so he was working with Gunthy Renker when they were just starting the industry. And he worked with Russ Chisholm doing the video stuff that was the first of its kind. So he pretty much helped pioneer the direct response TV market. 
Um, he's still a mentor. I meet with him for lunch. He's available to ask a few questions, but other than that, he's, uh, he's in the senior U.S. swim team, and he still plays uh, water polo uh, wow. on the senior league, so I call him Aquaman. <laughs> uh, but anyway, he is retiring, so uh, you're not going to find him answering his phone call that inventions didn't come anymore, so sorry. Uh, our dear Leslie is our speaker tonight. Great resource when it gets to really in the thicket of, of licensing uh, how, to, how to do this. This is what you hear about tonight. Our web developer, uh, our other helpers, uh, Jennifer and Alejandra and David, thank you so much for doing our videography. We appreciate it. All right, and then us, I am Adrian Pelkis, A Square Technologies. It's my contributions that uh, bring this together, keep it rolling. Um, I am like you at heart. This is why I'm here. I'm an inventor. This is my garage. Uh, when I have the time and the chance, this is where I'm down and actually playing or doing something I really like to do, which most times doesn't actually accomplish anything, but it's fun. Uh, just like any hobbyist or maker, you know, uh, I'll try to make something work. Sometimes it's for a purpose that I'm asked. Other times, I make sculptures. I like to repurpose materials and make a sculpture that lights up or it turns on or something. I've got quite a sort of my sculptures now. So. Uh, but anyway, this is my being. Uh, yes, I have a business. Uh, I've made it into a profession over 30 years. I've helped develop uh, hundreds of products, uh, your products, and help you get them to market or help them get them licensed. Here's a few of them. Uh, I like industrial things. Projects that help mankind and the environment are my real core. So you're seeing things on here like the shopping cart wheels that lock up. Sorry about that. but. <laughs> it, it, okay. uh, voice activated switches, uh, there's some genetic research tools, aircraft stuff. The middle row is all medical things, and then the bottom row is kind of alternative energy and electric cars and fun stuff. So that's just a you know, small sample. Um, yeah, uh, I've been to this patent group now 15 times. I just filed my 16th last week. Uh, it's led to, uh, yes, some awards. Uh, one last couple of them have been uh, up in LA with uh, Mars City Design and some of the SpaceX groups and those guys. And uh, that's actually led to a startup that I'm now really involved with and uh, uh, we're, we're hoping we can get it launched here pretty soon. So uh, that's what I'm doing on that side. My other involvement is with the big national groups that help you inventors. So one of the bigger ones it's great, they educate, they empower. Uh, it's United Inventors Association. I'm really proud Eric's come down here to join, join us tonight and has been lately. Eric is a fellow board member with me over at UIA. So uh, we're concerned about education and advocacy and uh, working through programs to bring more of those, both of those things to you guys. Uh, the other group I'm very proud to be in, we're a little more serious about the politics side. We're actually a 501c4, meaning our members are actually in Congress lobbying, uh, as I've been as well. And I'll tell you more about that later. Uh, I'm also very proud now, I'm an advisor now with uh, IGA, uh, which is a group of all of us club leaders across the country. I'll, I'll tell you about this a little bit later. But we had to have a collective voice in Washington and it's been accomplished, there is one. Uh, and it's a great group and we meet once a month and Eric as well, and we talk about best practices and how to get more information out to you guys. So. Uh, because of this, uh, we are seeing all kinds of opportunities for new speakers and new presentations and this it, this it. Okay, so America's a great place, right? Mm -hmm. Yay! All right. I don't want to ask you to do the Pledge of Allegiance. Uh, by the way, I'm a vet, so you'll see that flag a few times, okay? It's to my heart. Uh, what's next to you? All right, what's new with you guys? It's been two months, oh my gosh. Uh, Imagine you've had so many things to talk or brag about. Who's uh, who wants to share something that you've done in the last couple of months? Did anybody get a patent filed, for example? I filed a probate. That's the way to go. You're on your run. You're on your run. Good for you. You have one year now to see if you do something, right? Very cool. Did you have a question with Washington, the USPTO, the Inventive Club? Oh, you are. Oh, great. Have fun. Have fun. I'm not going, but you'll see some of our friends there. And that's very cool. That'll work. And you went to, where did you go today? Oh, to the Hera Lab uh, Accelerating Program. Yes. Awesome. Awesome. Who knows about Hera Labs? Okay. And I didn't see any women that it's supposed to help raise their hands. Hera Labs. 
Yeah, Herald Labs is a group run by women, for women, with women investors, and they help women get their businesses started, and they've now raised national attention, got national funding. It's a great success story. It's an amazing facility. Uh, they, they have space, they have coaches. Um, it's just a fantastic organization that hatched right here uh, in San Diego. And I'm so glad and delighted that you got involved, and I hope they can, they can help you move that forward. So you imagine, please give us the feedback as it goes, too, OK? Right? OK, awesome. Did somebody uh, get a sale going? Get some first sales to market, something to market? Uh, hmm? Launch a new business? Uh, close a business? <laughs> Sometimes that's the best thing you could do. Well, I'll, 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 I'll share. I've, uh, I've, I've been super busy. Um, uh, a lovely lady who teaches a, a course in educating kids in the jungles and third world nations had an idea for a product. Um, and, and we had our discussions and uh, she in fact hired us and we're now in the development. I'm working with a guy in Australia and it's 18 hours ahead so he's already in tomorrow. <laughs> and. Uh, uh, but it, it's it's going to turn out. So we've started development of a new product that uh, we hope helps people, which is pretty cool. Um, yeah, the, the last month I did file a patent uh, for uh, the, the Safe Sense project, and uh, I'm sad to admit it, but we dro we dropped the U.S. We're not going to go to the U.S. anymore. We're going to China. It's just not sensible at all to get a patent in the U.S. in our opinion. So it's a business choice. It's actually, we still have the opportunity. It's called a PCT. It's like a provisional, but it's worldwide. Uh, but the point of the matter is because we want to go to China. Uh, so to make the change, we had to show enough changes in the original provisional to show it was something new, of new nature, and a new filing, which, in fact, <sighs> took a lot of work, but I think I got it. We added three new features to it. So yes, I filed a new patent, too. Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah, we're trying to get a business plan together for that, and uh, we've got the pieces. Uh, we've hired out and got the market research work done, a 45-page book of information so we know where the market is. Uh, we came up with some great slogans. We got an artist doing, well, she did a conceptual of the whole thing, but we need a little more detail, so I'm going back to another artist. And so anyway, we're getting the artworks done, because that's how it will be presented, is using animations and artwork. We can't afford the, the build of thing. The first unit itself is going to cost us 150 grand to even build a working model. Yeah. What category is it in? It's a health, it's a, it's this, okay. The uh, slogan is a non-pharmaceutical solution to depression and anxiety. Or it might be anxiety and depression, but that's uh, that's absolutely a huge market. There's 140 million people that have mental problems in the U.S., $600 billion spent on drugs. It's an issue that is like a taboo here, but it's absolutely insane. You know, it's serious. 40-something million people have serious anxiety. I mean, the statistics to this affect uh, employment, uh, time. It, it affects so much of our society. And we think we have a non-pharmaceutical way of helping you get a quick tune-up when you're at the mall, jump in the kiosk type of thing. OK? So that's, a, that's the heads up for that. Um, the Lumis, Lumisu. Lumisu, this doing fine. That's a pet product that I've licensed. Uh, I licensed that a couple of years ago. It's uh, been in a couple of trade shows, so it's uh, now taking off. We've got some good testimonies. It's a dynamic light therapy head that you can use on your pets to secure their skin condition, or there's a deep penetrating head for pain, joint issues, and that sort of thing. And uh, yeah, every once a, once a quarter I get a royalty check. <laughs> Um, actually, now we are designing uh, some second generation stuff too. So, uh, yeah, the beat goes on. Yeah, so thank you. What's the name of I, I, um, I've been interested in a particular something called grounding or earthing. I don't know if anybody's familiar with that, but I had developed some products based around it, and I found um, two companies, one in one category and one in another category, that are interested in me developing some things for them. So, that's kind of fun. It's, Something of interest. And it's, then the have beach, somebody else. it's the beach in a box? <laughs> kind of, yeah. <laughs> Except for, you know, I, it's people, pets, and plants. And I'm starting with the plants and pets first. So people are, people are more difficult. So. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what do you mean? <laughs> so. uh, yeah, I've seen some fascinating work with the 
frequencies and, and grounding. Yeah, it's not We're all susceptible to everything in the world, EMF noise and all this stuff. And some of us are a lot more susceptible and sensitive than others. Oh my gosh. And that's some people that can't get near an electric appliance. So, uh, yeah, it's all affecting us differently. And grounding is a good thing. Go out and hug a tree. I mean, there's, oh, yeah. there's therapies about this now. Uh, grounding, hugging trees, breathing fresh air. Gosh, it's amazing. <laughs> Go outside. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's like the discussion on, on Facebook I saw about the oxygen. Yeah. <laughs> oh my like, God. The guy was arguing with me about oxygen. I love it. <laughs> I was going to go off. I controlled myself. Mm, that's interesting, <laughs> wasn't it? Yeah, that was fun. Okay, anybody else? You got something going on that uh, you want to share with us? You got made? You got tried? You started getting working? Don't be shy. It went into production in several parts. Wow! What's that about? Uh, um, Matrix we saw oh. in, uh, in a vacuum. Oh, great! No dust. Yeah, no dust. Awesome. God, I wish you was, I was around when I had to move my company once because a shop next to us came in to, to cut marble and stuff, and was, the dust was instantly in the air. And we're running pick and place machines and robotics, and I can't live in that atmosphere. Yeah, we're collecting, and without water, uh, masonry saw. 99.8% of the dust. Ooh, 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 ooh. There's an improvement. Congratulations. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Where are you having it made? Uh, it's made in China. Oh, yeah, well, we'll beat you up later. Yeah. <laughs> no chance of it getting made here? Uh, not cost effectively. It's okay, sometimes cost. you're surprised, and sometimes I'm not, and uh, it, it can be, and yeah. it matters. So, well, yeah, you'll see the flavor of this tonight most of the time. Is, you know, keep it made here. We know the realities of it. Uh, our shop doesn't compete with Next Door China. We get over certain quantities. We just, you know, that's, that's the nature yeah. of it. Although things are changing, especially now with all these tariffs <coughs> going on. They change pretty much. Uh -huh. But congratulations. It's a move for us. You're, you're going to spend your money here in San Diego, right? Yeah. Yay! Good for you. Thank you. Who else? Want to share something? Tom, you're new aboard. I gotta welcome people. The guy's gonna meet Tom Mercer tonight. Tom's gonna board as a new volunteer. Uh, he was real helpful in us getting this sponsor sheet together. I'll show you that we have a new sponsor sheet. So grab one on your way out. If you want to, please do. If you know somebody that might want to sponsor us, please give one of these sheets. We'd love to see this group grow and money will help. Advertising and all those fun things could, could really expand things out. So. Thank you very much, Tom. And then later today, you see his name up here. He actually has a little segment that he's going to show you called the Insignificant Significant Inventing, which is stories about inventions and, and ideas and how they came about. So that'll be fun. So thank you for sharing. Coming up later. All right, well, we can keep it moving. Um, let's see. Who's new here tonight? One, two, guys, two new guys. I'm going to show you something. The rest of everybody, hang in there. You've seen this before, but it's usually worth repeating. Our mission is to motivate, educate, and network inventors to become successful entrepreneurs, start businesses here in San Diego. Um, actually, along these lines, I have started working in LA to create a sister club. And it's coming along. We already have six core people, a few of the key people that have to run things, and, and so on and so forth. So, but the mission statement's the same. All right, so we're soon going to have a sister group. Uh, now, this is a new schedule, guys. Since we took the month off, I shifted the last two meetings down a month. So what this amounts to is that we do every year kind of have a curriculum, usually from the first how to capture the idea, then how to get the IP, the patents filed, um, then how to do market research on it, then how to manufacture it. I think I'm going the right order. Manufacturing, then marketing. Uh, I do a thing that's pretty popular here is the top 20 mistakes I've made in my life, maybe you can learn from it uh, and avoid uh, making those mistakes. Um, we do have speakers, some of them are uh, bigger names like Warren Tuttle uh, came out and he's uh, the head of one of those groups I told you about. Um, licensing tonight, you're going to have an awesome opportunity to meet Leslie who's quite the professional and works with bigger companies but really knows the whole gambit including international licensing and really fine points. Uh, you're going to hear us brag tonight about Stephen Key. Most of his things have been household goods and, and pet products and toys. Leslie can take it to the next level. If you're talking about changing the world with some scientific innovation, she's the kind of person that can really get into that. Uh, so uh, the next one is Stephen Key. Speaking of uh, 
a very uh, renowned now uh, writer of the book, One Simple Idea, which we suggest you read if you're interested in licensing your product. It's a great primer on what the whole process is and what it's about. He coaches, he teaches, he's got a great website. I'll tell you more about his information. And then in two months, guys, we're back to having a contest. Woohoo! Who wants to submit their product for the contest this year? One, two, right here. Three, four, five. Yes. Is that question? Have to be a, uh, like the final product? No, like no. Product. But you got to have some protection on it. At least have a have a provisional file. No, you can show us anything. Uh, you know how these things. You know how presentations go. Uh, uh, this is a popularity contest, so um, you know, we used to be a little more selective about the grading, but nobody went back to look at the points. So it really turned out to be for a second. But. Uh, we have seen people that have taken the news of their winnings here and gone to the news and leveraged it and, and uh, really publicized it. So we're, with Tom's help this year, hoping we can get uh, actually another news channel to actually here for the event. Uh, it's sort of a shame we've kept it so quiet. It's such a fun event and it's really a community event for all of San Diego. So we're going to get some news channels out here, aren't we? I'm going to make some phone calls. <laughs> okay. Absolutely. And there's plenty of other videos, again, on storage that they can look at if they wanted to see. If anybody knows anybody at them, give me a name and please do. Oh, yeah. Okay. Well, it's news at KOSI. It's, there's, yes, we will. Please, anybody that has any of those contacts, share. All right. So that's the point is there's a schedule. Uh, we do meet this monthly. We do have speakers every month. They know their stuff. They talk about it. Uh, it's led to having tons of videos out there. Uh, people from uh, our local connect group have spoken, Axion, they, they do micro loans, they've spoken. Uh, our own dear Michelle has spoken many times. Michelle, are you uh, have any news for us tonight, as a matter of fact? Did anything you wanted to announce or share? Nothing spectacular? CPA's been working hard and <coughs> moving things forward, especially... Uh, Michelle is a, 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 a head of the... Southern California Coalition for Prosperous America, an in, a national group uh, for the purpose of helping manufacturers and businesses. It's nonpartisan. Uh, they look at trade agreements, trade laws. They help stop TPP, for example. Right now, they're very involved with understanding what these uh, tariffs are gonna do and are doing. Uh, and really, this goes back to the beginning of CPA when they were looking at our trade agreements, right. realizing that we could change our GDP over, it was over 2% overnight if we would just change some of these crazy trade laws that have been very unfair. We're, we're um, this, this summer I'm visiting congressional offices um, in Southern California and we have some solutions that we're proposing now. We've done a lot, we've ha um, had a new research director now for about a year and a half and he's really done some fantastic and they're going to coming out with a new job quality index because we've been producing lower paying jobs that are not, you mm. know. So there, it's going to be an actual index showing um, what kind of jobs we're creating. <clears throat> we've got some solutions per, to propose to um, eliminate the trade deficit and the over, um, overvalued dollar and the mm. undervalued currency of Germany and Japan in particular. Nice. So we're focusing on these, uh, these um, and also how to stop Chinese investors from buying U.S. companies through CFIUS, Committee on um, Foreign Investment. So mm -hmm. we're, we're involved with a lot of these things right now. Mm -hmm. <coughs> time right there. Thank you, Michelle. Yeah. It takes such a commitment to, to, to go and get involved with these groups and to share news. Chinese spy for 20 years. Anyway. We are nice, nice, nice. very happy Michelle's here. You can meet her. Uh, she writes different articles for magazines, and she's one of the best experts in town for manufacturing. She's been a manufacturer's rep as long as I've done it, and has uh, represented some of the best companies in town for whatever different field or specialty you're looking for. Metal work, plastic work, molding, uh, electronics, right, uh, and, and and so on. So if Anybody in here want to, if you, anybody in here wants to learn or contact somebody who can help them with their manufacturing, Michelle's the person to talk to. All right, uh, uh, plenty of others here. I would uh, spend all my thinking all long and hard. Uh, uh, <coughs> these are all worth a shout out. Uh, Judy uh, wrote our newsletter for quite a few years. I thank her for all of that. And then uh, she wrote a book called Your Mind on Marketing because as an inventor and as a professional psychologist, 
she realized most inventors don't have the mind to even want to think about marketing, and she turns into a fun and challenging thing that lets you break those barriers. Uh, her husband is one of the best experts on doing focus groups. He teaches entrepreneurism at Cal State University of San Marcos. Uh, one of his sayings, I, I ought to get the bumper sticker made for all you guys, it's a, that uh, a focus group, it can save you a million or make you a million. Mm -hmm. um, and in reality, I've met people who have gone up to three to 50,000, never had the focus group and lost it all because they didn't know what the customer wanted. And again, the definition of product development is bringing to the market, that's its own chore, a customer accepted item. That means it was focus group first. Bringing to the market, customer accepted item from initial concept through design and into manufacturing on a predetermined cost, budget, and schedule. Yes, it's actually an 11 word or something definition, but the three, four important ones are bringing to the market a customer accepted idea. Don't bring stuff that I love the idea. Well, you never ask anybody else if they did, and so that, that, that's. I've got a corner of one of my offices of stuff that people went to China and bought the whole boat load, well, the trailer load, and they can't sell it for what they even put into it because they didn't know the features weren't customer acceptable. Anyway, he's an expert. You can hire him. He'll tell you stuff. This is the fellow that companies like Ford and the big companies go to to do market research, but he's willing to do it at any level. Uh, we've had other entrepreneurs, that, uh, this, this couple, they've been doing it ever since they were in their teens and they come back and share their experiences. Other inventors that have come every month and shared their products. Yeah, pet owners, we have a lot of people in the pet, how many people are working in the pet industry right now in, this, in here, working on some pet stuff? Okay, there's a couple. We have a, a number of people that are really into the pets thing and yeah, uh, uh, Josh is certainly one of them. He's got a couple of products, he's got this one, he's got a ball throwing thing. Uh, he goes to the pet shows, uh, to bathroom things. Uh, he's, uh, Andrew's finally getting this to the market and it's going into uh, senior homes. And so anyway, the idea is we have different inventors every month. They share their paths and their products uh, and their tribulations. <laughs> um, and uh, there's Josh again with his, with his other product. Um, and kids as well. We've had kids that are here that have come through the program and have actually created things. Do you ever see curly pets? Do you know what those are? It's like a little fuzzy thing, but you snap it on your wrist and it wraps around your wrist, and oh. it's a little, a little you seen it? You know which one I mean? Well, two young kids your age, they developed that here in San Diego, and they came to this meeting, and um, they won our invention contest, I think two years in a row. Mm -hmm. They stole the show. Yes, they get their products made in, in China, but they know their business inside and out, and they're, they're doing really well. So young kids can be entrepreneurs too. It's just how creative are you? And, Give me the word out. They they did a Kickstarter campaign and it was successful for them. That helped them launch it, and that's a social media uh, play. And it really took them having a great video. Unless their parents were able to help them make that great video, but that's that's how you get it going. Anyway, up to some bigger players. If you ever saw the show Edison Nation, or you've ever heard of Inventus, Inventus is here in town. They help you go from product to market. Uh, do the uh, I think that I was just talking about the social media is crowdfunding. crowdfunding, yes. And then uh, Lewis Foreman, uh, he started Inventor Digest magazine, the uh, Edison Nation TV show was his, uh, and uh, so he's got quite the career in this. So we've brought in some all kinds of different levels of people that speak every month. All right, uh, they were all videotaped, and they're available. Our videographer now is David. Thank you, David. Uh, the, uh, I'm, I'm very proud of one of my videos, I think it's like 30,000 views now, is that 17 mistakes video, so you don't have to wait till next year to see it. Dive in and watch it now, <laughs> and you'll see why this whole group meets. I got very upset by people going to the wrong places at the wrong time and getting really ripped off. Going to companies like InventHelp or some of these invention submission companies, they've got a scam plan that they've been running for years, and when enough people get upset about it, the FCC finally closes them down and they rebrand themselves. So we know who the rotten players are that really prey on people's hopes and dreams, and we try to help you avoid that. What you learn here in this group is how to do things kind of like a la carte to get to what's called the next inflection point. Where's the next level where your company or your idea is worth a little bit more to, then you can go to the next level. You do this and you take the steps to bring your products to market. But some of these invention submission companies, I used to cry hearing people saying they got a loan on grandma's house so they can buy $12,000 worth of generic material that was useless. 
just garbage, useless, generic material. And that's what some of these bigger submission companies that ship rocks in the middle of the night give you. They've changed their picture a little bit. Was that one George rocks. Foreman was advertising? Yeah, well, they paid a lot. So. Yeah, um, there's a couple. <laughs> there's a couple. <laughs> I think I heard that somewhere, yes. Uh, yeah, before this, before uh, Dave Hero City, Dave City did uh, so many years of work. Um, Sydney has a big art show coming up in Encinitas that uh, we're publicizing on our Facebooks. Uh, and Danny, I heard you're going to play the music at the opening, aren't you? Yes. Woohoo! That would be a twofer. What day is that? August 19th. 19th, a Sunday. 1 p.m. to 4 p.m. Encinitas Library, right? Yep. And okay. And uh, his uh, artwork is up there right now. It is. Awesome. Until, uh, thank you. Sydney's uh, Sydney's amazing. He's an artist. He's a naturalist. He's an inventor. He's a videographer. Uh, a dear friend of ours. Uh, he's on our board here. And uh, uh, so anyway, he helped create our video channel and indeed created his own uh, video uh, <coughs> site called Inventors TV. And the idea here was to get all the information we could as far as news for inventors and resources and uh, by affiliates. The idea was we were going to have our clubs all join, and our club did. Uh, I think AIG has taken the lead on this idea of getting the club's videos together, but we'll be catering to individual inventors. When I say we, I'm helping Sydney on the project too. So uh, yes, we have some sponsors for it. The idea is to have a channel, a webcast channel that shows everything video that we can find to help inventors. So that's what Inventor TV is. Okay, check it out. All right, um, how am I doing time-wise? Oh, 10 minutes late. So, that's okay. I don't think we got that many people here to start talking and bragging. Um, anybody have some new products that they wanted to share or get some feedback on tonight? Please do, Ruth. Well, I just got the prototype for the um, provisional patent that I submitted, and it worked perfectly fine, and I'm going to New Year's Eve um, next week. What is the it that you're referring to? Well, it's a new uh, innovation for the same thing I've been working on, the bed sheets. Sheets, um, excellent. Bed excellent, excellent. Ruth's invented a new sheet that makes it easier and faster to put them on beds. and. You would think hotels and places that put on hundreds and thousands of sheets a day would probably want to see the advantage of saving some time and, and effort. They in the corners and they mm. don't snap up the mattress in the middle of the night. So these are just... Keep it going. Being persistent is the key here. The more people you see react to it and give you a positive reaction, the more you'll feel encouraged to do this too. So good. Yes. Uh, okay, so you've been working on this as far as presenting it now for how long? Well, I, uh, the first time was in September of last year, but I just have done a few presentations, including the one that I did here. Top Dog. Was that yes. this year? Mm -hmm. Yes. That was this year. Okay. All right, so you're getting the practice of getting it out there. Have you been to any of the bigger trade shows yet or no. homeware shows? No. Okay, all right. There's an expense to that. Uh, so this is for all of you that are wondering, how am I getting my product to market? There's a lot of ways. Social media, a, a, a real popular way though, is going to trade shows that are in your area and getting a little booth and showing this off and getting the reactions, seeing if people aren't in fact interested in licensing it or distributing it for you, which if you're at the right shows, this is where this happens and those connections are made. So that's a real popular angle too. Uh, there's of course the contests that are out there now and the, and the TV shows that are out there. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if there isn't a TV show just for women now, uh, for uh, women inventors. I don't know. There's one for unmarried couples. <laughs> yeah. Um, there's all kinds of these shows. Well, we'll, we'll talk about that. Um, so yeah. Who else has a new product? Uh, again, you can, by the way, for you guys that are new here, you can bring the product here. Uh, that thing you signed since it's your first time here was a, a notice that we will act as your witnesses that you did in fact present here. This is a public forum. So if you public here, if you public here, if you present it here, uh, this is a public forum. So it is a, uh, a public showing. So it starts a one-year clock that you have to file within. 
it's kind of like doing a provisional patent without filing for it. But you do have to claim this was shown on this date. So speak with your patent agent. Better yet, file something, then come here and talk about it all you want. And uh, nobody can go back in the time machine. Unless, did anybody invent a time machine yet? <laughs> yeah, we just have this one simple little problem. It's just the one simple yeah. problem. That's true, it is. It's no, the one little problem. Well, I always ask that because someday I imagine someone's going to pop up and go to the meme way uh, and tell me, yes, we finally done this. Now, believe it or not, there's patents out there on time machines, and I, I have, I, I should bring it. There's one of a guy who created a spaceship that can fly in different dimensions. It's patented. So what's the point of this little discussion? If you can teach an art, you can patent anything. You don't have to reduce it to practice, but you have to do a really good job of explaining it. So yeah, he uses antimatter and all these weird ideas that just don't aren't practical, but he got a patent for it. Recently? Hmm? No. <laughs> no. No, way before Alice. <laughs> True. True. Um, if there was any commercial value to it, it would have long been challenged, wouldn't it? Yeah. Uh, this is kind of like time machine. My son is leaving Shanghai at 1 p.m. and arriving in L.A. at 10.05 a.m on the same day, so. Uh, yes, that's true. So that's kind of. Yes, huh. we can do that now. Weird. Yeah. Well, my friend in Australia, he's in tomorrow already. Yeah. And uh, that's all a weird concept. So if you call him tonight, it's yeah. already tomorrow. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm calling him around Explain midnight, that. and it is. Uh, I can tell you the lottery numbers for tonight. <laughs> <laughs> it worked that way. That would be real cool. <laughs> Wasn't that one of the Back to the Futures? Sure. Oh no, that was the book with the scores. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Same idea. Uh, anybody starting something new just now? Starting something new so you're here to figure out how the steps might work? So one one of you guys have question me tonight about one that were you talking about that or let's introduce yeah, yeah. some new members here because yeah, uh, there's only two of you. All right. Please. My name is Andrew. I uh, where I'm at in, in the invention, I, I have a, a utility patent. Uh, I have a prototype. Hmm. I, I'm here to kind of kind of network, uh, search for some manufacturing, kind of price it out. I have one in mind, but it's always good to shop around. Uh, packaging. I have someone that that's in LA, but I'm still kind of shopping around. Uh, I'm hoping to, to launch it before Christmas because it has to run along the line with the uh, Apple iPad, which you know, iPads. You know, they, you can Google it. They sold 13.8 million. Uh, you know, annually. So it ranges from eight, dual gender, gender eight to, to 58. So uh, I'm kind of excited about it, but I, I need to, I'm here for a little bit of mentorship and, and also. Yeah. Well, uh, my first question is actually one thing I'm known for saying it's marketing is the horse that pulls the cart. So uh, marketing. having all the patents and having designed it and developed it, and it's okay, that's great. Now, if you sell one, it starts the whole process of having a business. So. Marketing is what's going to make you sell one. Have you got any of the marketing angles for you? Uh, I, I, it's I'm kind of gearing it to uh, uh, I, I could I could do sell it to schools, private schools. Uh, my you could personally. I, I can. You know, okay. Uh, awesome. But the big idea is just to, to license to Disney because you know, once Star Wars Star Wars comes out, you know Disney. So well, I think licensing to Disney falls under the caliber of working with a really major player. So there's where Leslie could come in to be a super uh, asset for you to talk about dealing on those levels. She's the head of IP for Jack in the Box. So she's the one that makes all the license agreements for everyone with little toys and all, a lot of emotional stuff. And So uh, that's the kind of, Well, welcome, Andrew. We welcome Andrew to our group. Yay! Uh, a number of us would love to help you figure out how to manufacture something. So <laughs> we'll, we'll find some solutions for that here too. Sure. And you are my friend. What's your name? Yes, uh, hi, everybody. My name is uh, Rafael. And talking about marketing, I'm working on a startup to connect uh, people with top freelancers around the world. Um, my reason for being here is just to get some feedback, some initial thoughts. Uh, we just launched the site, uh, so I would love to, to get my business card and and, and follow up on the conversation. And uh, just uh, like him, just getting some mentorship and, and connecting with people. Awesome, I feel awesome, awesome. Well, uh, what, I mean, I've worked with Upwork lots of times. You see Elance, but I use Upwork and I get all kinds of different professionals. What kind of people are you dealing with? Are you talking about .com, is that what you said, or? 
Yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a great question. Uh, very similar to Upwork and Fiverr, some of the mm -hmm. most popular platforms. Uh, but when you work with those platforms, you work directly with the freelancers. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you get good ones, sometimes you don't, and you mm -hmm. have to search for more. Uh, so with us, we're going to have a person, a project manager that ensures that the, the quality is there so you don't have to be looking for freelancers. Uh -huh. uh, they're already going to be vetted, so you only work with tough freelancers so that you're looking for web design or paid, paid advertising, that's a solution that we can provide. Okay, so your profit model then is charging a little bit extra for that, it's value service. Correct. Okay. 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 Which okay. Which worth it. Uh, it's called a Hyper, H-I-P, uh, the number 3R dot I-O. I know it sounds uh, different. Uh, it's Hyper basically, but instead of an E, we turn that into a number three. So okay. hyper.io. Our company is eight cents. We're using the eight. Is the eight. Anyway, yeah. Graphics <laughs> images and load. Awesome. Congratulations. More and more, the world's training that team. Instead of hiring a whole team and, and investing in all the overhead of HR, anyway, you just all the cart hire the people with the professions you want. Uh, yeah, and it takes me you know, a couple hours to sort through the list. They do bring people that have got the highest stars, whatever, to the top, but you still have to go through them, search them, find out what they'll, you know, charge and if they've got experience. I usually come up with a questionnaire and uh, give everybody the same questionnaire and grade them on that matrix, so that's how I've been pretty successful myself with that. Yeah, my last researcher uh, worked out of, was it England in India? point is he's got a PhD and he's writing me a 45-page thesis and it only costs 500 bucks. <laughs> I mean, you come you know, <laughs> where else can you get that? Your side. <laughs> All right, there you go. There you go. Anybody else? You got something starting up? Something mm -hmm. new? Moving to the next level? Dan, what's happening with Sipsy? Uh, we're in the promotional product space now, and uh, had a great showing at the uh, promotional product expo in Las Vegas. Oh. Uh, so it's a great uh, way to uh, get your uh, logo or organizational logo out there in a meaningful manner with something going to help reduce waste. So. Awesome. Yay, Dan. Yay, Dan. I'm going to brag about you a little bit later in relation to the, the, the show that we did that, that you did here. So, uh, but you're getting sales going is the bottom line? Yep, yep. Yay, Dan. <laughs> That's what we want to hear. Yeah, what show is that? Uh, PPAI. Awesome. Very good, very good, very good. Who else can I pick on because you guys can really tell me about what's going on? That's great. Well, okay. I won't drag it out of you. Um, this uh, next month, again, is Stephen Key. He'll be the inventor and the speaker of the month. Um, if you do want to come and show and use this as a focus group, you're so welcome. And that's always a really great first reaction to see. Uh, and it's not biased because these people want your family. So that's the whole point is quit talking to your family about it. They're not going to tell you what your baby's over. Uh, but get it out there and get some feedback. Um, I'll share with you though, this isn't, even though you do a, a small feedback group, it's often helpful to do a larger one. Last year we had an inventor come out with this new chopstick and it looked like a pair of forceps and had an interesting spring action. The group here liked it, but they didn't touch it and use it. Well, we went to the next step and had the professional run three focus groups at a Chinese restaurant with over half a dozen people and each time all of them hated it. <laughs> They didn't like the way it looked. They thought it was medical. The muscles were different. Uh, it, it, so it acted differently than a normal chopstick. And so Dean scored 32, which saved him hundreds of thousands of dollars from having to go into tooling and finding out that this wasn't what people wanted. But anyway, the point is the size of the focus group and how detailed the questions are, even sometimes to a point of yeah, touchy-feely, can really make the whole difference. Because from 20 feet, you know, the expression 20 feet, are, car going by is it a 20 foot car it looks great at 20 feet going 20 miles an hour anyway, same thing with products and ideas you know show them quick and if it's far away it looks great it's a prop put it in their hands and actually have them use it and you get a whole different feedback so that's important well i think we're going to get back on schedule and invite leslie back in to uh, take the lead on the next stage here of presenting to you guys uh, what she likes to share about licensing and I want you all to have your notebooks out and pencils ready. And uh, let's see. Oh, she's working on the stage. Great. 
Let's see what we got to do to get your presentation up here. Do we need to mic, Leslie? Do we mic anybody anymore? No? No microphones needed. Okay. All right. Let me uh, try to. I'll see if everything works out. I'm going to escape that. And then yours is. These publications here, if anybody this one? wants to take one, they're excess that I mm -hmm. get and find an interest in there, okay. it's a cake one. Great. I can't absorb all of it. <laughs> I was looking for something. There we go, and the button is, here's the button. All right, let's see, does it work? It's working. Yay! Okay, ladies and gentlemen, it's my honor, it's my delight, it's my privilege to introduce you to Leslie Wagner, our resident expert on IP and licensing. Ladies and gentlemen, Leslie Wagner. Hi. Um, how many of you have heard me speak before in person? And how many of you have gone online and watched our video series? And Okay. So the reason I ask is because what I'm not going to do is, come on. Lower right. Okay. Lower right. There you go. There are some areas of IP that I'm not going to discuss tonight, and that's simply because you have the ability to go over to our SDIF website and watch my prior videos. I don't like to necessarily repeat topics that I've done before because one, for those of you who come and have seen me talk before, that's not all that interesting for you. And two, because the information is readily available. So this is not going to be part of the discussion tonight. Which one did you push? Um, IP basics. I'm assuming that the fact that you're all here, you have some idea of what IP even means. Please tell me you do by show of hands. Computer address. <laughs> <laughs> Correct, but the wrong one for tonight. <laughs> intellectual property. So tonight I'm not going to talk about intellectual property again because you should already know it, but if you don't, you can go to the website and look up one of my prior videos where I talk about exactly what intellectual property is. I'm also not going to talk about how to find a licensee. Again, one because that topic's already been discussed and is available, and two, because we could go all night. There, are a, there is additional information that I provide to you kind of on a one-on-one -on -one basis. We can talk about that a little bit later, but again, that's not a topic for tonight. I'm gonna tell you all the things I'm not gonna talk about before we get into things that we will, just so you're clear on what the purpose of tonight's discussion is about. This is not a discussion on how to negotiate a licensing deal because one, that's not a one session understanding of even how to negotiate through a licensing deal. Uh, that is something that I do on a one-on-one -on -one session with you. There's a lot that goes into that, a lot of planning, a lot of strategy before you even get to the word negotiation. Key licensing deals and terms, this kind of goes along with IP basics. Um, until you understand what your intellectual property portfolio is, until you understand where your opportunities are, you're not ready for a licensing deal. And that brings us to tonight's discussion. I'm going to take you not one, not two, but probably three steps pre-licensing deal. Really want to get into really are you ready? Because unfortunately, I meet with a lot of people who they think they're ready. They may even have already gone so far as to talking to a prospective licensee, and they're not ready. They fail miserably because there are a lot of steps involved. There's a lot of pre-thinking that you need to understand about yourself, about the product, about the market space. And unless and until you know those things, I don't think that anyone should be seeking out a licensee. And here's some of the things that we're going to talk about. In today's climate where everyone is bombarded with new products, new services, new ways of doing things, new ways of seeking information, new ways of watching entertainment, the, the reality is in order to connect today, you need to have a story. 
And so my new approach is how can you create a story for your product, for your brand, for your licensee to be able to connect with you. And the connection is really related to sometimes on an emotional level. You know, what problem are you solving for, your, for the individual, for the environment, for you know, a segment of the market, whatever the case may be. But having some sort of connection to make them want to buy into you know, your brand, your product, a lot, you know, wanting to do a license, license deal with you, is, is something you should really think about. You know, there are a lot of ways that people are doing that today. They're doing it through this so-called, you know, charitable angle where, you know, you buy one, I'm going to donate one, or you buy one, I'm going to donate some of my proceeds or profits, or, you know, they're, they're creating this connection. And for a lot of companies, that's, that's working. Tom's is obviously one of the biggest examples of where that's working. But it is being oversaturated right now. Uh, a lot of people are, are taking that angle and they're not being successful or they're not being sincere. And the worst thing you can do in this, in this age is be insincere. You also want to make sure that you're not tapping into a connection that's already near exhaustion. Right? So you can't be, I don't want to use this word in this, in this particular way, but another me too. And I'm not referring to the me too movement. I'm just saying you're another one of many who are essentially doing something similar or in a way that's similar to what a lot of other people are doing. So you're losing that somewhat level of credibility, uniqueness, and even maybe even some level of connection because you know what? People get burnt out. When they hear the same message over and over and over, you lose that connection. So find a way to stand out and create your own connection. Think about how that connection might evolve over time, not only for your brand, but for your product line. And we'll talk about product line in a few minutes. Because you want to make sure that whatever that connection is, that it, it can be maintained. You know, that it can grow over time, that you can create that connection. So if, in fact, you, what you're thinking about is something that someone would buy over time or on a repeat basis, they're doing that because they've created that connection. Um, because brand loyalty, is, is really fleeting at this point in time. They're really looking for value, a strategic angle, a product angle, but most importantly, I think they're looking for that long-term connection, and, and that seems to be making a real big difference in today's market. The licensee and the potential consumer need to believe in your product or brand, and so again, that connection is very important. Um, Depending on where you are and how far you are in your process, you may already be working on that. You may have already developed some of that. If you already have a product that's out in the market, you may have an opportunity to get some feedback from people who have bought your product or invested in your service and get testimonials from them. And be careful, though, when you get that testimonial, make sure it's an earnest one. There, there is a way that you can strategically involve influencers. How many of you are, know what an influencer is? A handful. So an influencer is someone who is basically an internet celebrity for the most part, who has a following, whether it's on Facebook or Instagram or some other medium, they have a following. And it, you know, it could be created to a particular segment like beauty or health or uh, you know, tools or whatever the case may be. But they have a connection. They have a following with consumers out there. And they will sign a deal with you to market and promote your brand as, a, um, as an influencer, meaning they'll basically do a little commercial almost for you, whether it's an unboxing or demonstration or, hey, I like the way this lipstick feels, whatever the case is. They'll do that for you. Just be careful that you know, you're choosing the right influencer because I'm sure that you can come up in your mind right now of at least one, two, or three influencers who were major brand sponsors who have done very bad things and have now damaged those brands. So be careful if you are going to go the influencer route that you really understand the value of an influencer, how to choose one, their purpose and intent, and that their message is as genuine and or honest as it can be, being that they're likely going to be a paid influencer. 
I could spend a whole topic on just talking about marketing and use of influencers. I do it all the time. Um, and, but we're not going to do that tonight. I just want to mention it because when I talk about creating a value and a connection, that is a way that you can do that. Um, and use of testimonials in that capacity because an influencer is essentially offering a sort of testimonial. Um, what I also want to talk about is, you know, how does your, co your, your story coincide with your potential licensee? So make sure that the partner that you're choosing is not counterintuitive. So if you have worked hard on understanding what your connection is, what you want your connection to be, what you want your brand to be, what you want your message to be, you want to make sure that that is not counterintuitive to who it is that you're going to partner with. So if you're all about saving the environment or you know something like that and then you pick a partner that has been in the press for doing bad things with the environment, that's obviously going to be counterintuitive to what it is that you're trying to do and the message that you're trying to send. You also make sure, again want to make sure that you're, you don't, you're not coming across as a sellout because what's happening a lot too is small brands are starting out, they're putting out their own testimonials, they're doing the own things on the internet, they're kind of proposing themselves as kind of the, the new and inventive and, and the hometown or you know the, the small guy kind of mentality and then they do something that's completely counter to that and they give the appearance that hey I'm selling out. Um, and that's where you're going to lose a lot of your initial brand base again if you're, if you're that far into the process. Um, once you have that preliminary plan, that preliminary thought about who you are, what do you want to be, how do you want to present yourself to the consumer, then think about are you actually still even ready for a licensing deal. So again, this is taking you from, you know, kind of like that's a little bit outside of the conceptual box, but then it's really understanding is, am I still ready to go talk to someone? Because here, you want to make sure that your IP is ready for licensing, meaning do, your, do you have your intellectual property portfolio secure? Do you have whatever patents in, in application and or issue? Do you have trademarks locked down? Do you own any copyrights? Do you ha if you are going to go the trade secret route, do you have that stuff well protected? All those other areas of intellectual property understood, locked down, secured, and protected before you start going and disclosing information to protect prospective licensees. The next step is, do you have a documented intellectual property strategy? This isn't a throw it at the wall and see what sticks. You screw up a licensing deal, you, it's really hard to go back and fix it, okay? So really, you need to make sure that you understand what goes into a licensing deal the nuances of the different strategic options that are available to you and you have that planned out. Um, what I do is once you have your intellectual property secure, I have basically a framework that if I sit down and work with you, we kind of map things out. We have a, a broad understanding of who you are, where you are, where do you want to go, um, what are your market opportunities. It's, it's a whole checklist, if you will. It's a readiness checklist that then we take that and we can put a plan together so that then we get to the point where we have basically what I refer to as a one sheet. Um, not always a one sheet, but it's really kind of like an outline then of all this stuff that we've done and put together in terms of this plan and summed it down to a couple of major level, high level bullet points that when you're ready to talk to a licensor, these are the key things we're going to talk about first. Because if you can't get through these key major discussion points, you're not going to get any further than that. And it's really easy to start with that discussion first, then try to go in and say, hey, I want a license agreement, and then you've got all of this stuff to go through. You really want to make sure you start small and then work towards the hard stuff. If you are beyond um, concept and you are in a commercialization phase already, uh, think about are you already a household or new or emerging brand. And again, structure your, your um, research with potential licensees based on that concept. Um, I'm going to skip down here for a moment first. Uh, sorry, here. 
Um, do you have metrics that are available? If you are already selling, um, what are your ratings? What are some of those metrics that you can show that demonstrate some you know, initial or preliminary success that you've already had? Um, whether that's consumer ratings, whether that's reviews, whether that's sales numbers, number of downloads, if it's something that's viewable or downloadable or accessible you know, via the internet. Obviously, all the financials that go with that are kind of a no-brainer. That's why it's not up here, because if you don't know your numbers, then you're not going to get anywhere. But these are some other things that you need to, to, to be aware of. And what does your online presence say about you? That's not just Googling yourself or your product or your brand, but doing some more exhaustive and extensive research about people who have bought, people who have looked at your product, look at your metrics um, with related to your website. Um, all of those are tools that are readily available. They're not very much money. Um, Google Analytics is a real simple one. It doesn't take a lot to learn that, but it, you know, it's really informative and gives you a lot of digestive information about you know, who's really trying to find out information about you and then obviously who's bought. Um, and those are all good metri metrics to have available. So when you are talking to a prospective licensee, Again, you're demonstrating some level of preliminary success before uh, that will hopefully get them excited about wanting to do business with you. If you're not already there, how are you going to get there? Um, because you can't simply rely on the prospective licensee to have all the answers, know all the answers, and really have the, the direct path to get you to market. So have an idea about what you think it's going to take to get you to market. What are those distribution logistics? And I'm talking about the entire supply chain, right? I'm not just talking about how to get it off the truck or out of the warehouse over to you know, a retail space, you know, shelf space. I'm talking about the entire logistics of the, the, the supply chain. You've got to have an idea of what you think that might take if, if you haven't already. Um, because again, that's not, that's not only going to help you understand what it's going to take to get your product to market, but as you're working with a potential licensee and these issues come up, these questions come up, these discussions are part of the negotiation and you have to have an idea of, of what that means to you. Think about the, the ways in which you're going to sell, obviously online or brick and brick and mortar, the two obvious, right? But consider that brick and mortar is severely shrinking. Um, you know, the cannibalization of the brick and mortar space is phenomenal. Stores are closing every single day. And not only are stores closing, but store and footprints are getting smaller. So in order to get on that shelf, pace, shelf space, it's a highly competitive environment. And so you've got to have either a unique opportunity, ability to demonstrate that you have a product that could displace something that may not be selling, that's a higher value product, that's a better value product, or it simply has a perceived value to the customer that's simply going to help product move. Because the reality is, retail space is not going to automatically sell your product. I'm sure you've all been into a store and seen that clearance or discount aisle. It's there for a reason, because the stuff didn't move. Just because it's on the shelf doesn't mean it's going to sell. So there are obligations with, between the licensee and yourself that, that relate to how to market and sell the product. And though again, that's an area that you really need to think about because just because you've got that licensee, just because you made it onto the shelf of a Walmart or a Best Buy or wherever does not mean they're all going to sell through and you're all going to get rich and you're going to get your big fat royalty checks. It's just not going to happen. So think about where your product fits within the retail space. What are the best mechanisms to get that product out there to market? Because again, you want to make sure that your licensee fits and, and, and you guys are on the same page relative to that and that you, can, you, you have success in being able to, to reach that goal. Continuing with that is how do you see your brand growing with that licensee? Is it scalable? Or is it really just a, or is, are you really a product or a product line? So the difference is kind of a one and done. You know, is this a one shot deal? Do you have opportunities for expansion? Do you have opportunities for growth? Think about the kind of single use kind of razor, razor blade model. That's always an excellent example. You know, you, you might give away the razor for free, but you're gonna make a 
killing on the razor blades. Maybe not so much in today's market with some new competition, but the idea is that you have a model that is gonna, is gonna be scalable, that's gonna have some longevity, that's gonna give you and the licensee some you know, long-term revenue stream and hopefully be, bring, have the consumer coming back more and more and more and or referring them to people so that they buy your product. So you, you get the benefit of returning customers and potentially new ones. If you have a unique value proposition, again, it's, it's rare in this day to say I have a completely new, unique, rare product. In, in most cases, you're looking at some sort of displacement or a kind of like the better mousetrap, another way of doing it or a better way of doing it. But it being absolutely, completely brand new and unique, probably slim. So you want to make sure that you understand what is, if in that case, what's the uniqueness about this that's going to drive the consumer to want to buy this if they already have something like it that does something sort of like it, that does something okay? Why would, they, why would it drive them to go to, the, go to wherever they need to go spend their hard-earned money to buy that item and either toss out or have it complementary to what they already might have in their home, right? So think about that. Market timing. This is a really critical one when you're seeking out a licensee is, you know, how long, is it, how long do you think it's going to take the product the, to get the product to market? Working with your licensee, your distribution, your supply chain, your manufacturer, these things will kind of come into play. You'll get a better understanding of that. But really having some good idea of that and what the timing it takes to be able to capitalize on that opportunity are going to be very critical. Because if you have a product that you know, is ripe, ripe because of seasonality or it's on trend or uh, you know, maybe it's going to be a big um, Christmas push, if you will, you want to make sure that the timing of that really works out with your potential licensee and ensure that they have the resources to meet whatever those time sensitive deadlines and targets are. Because the worst thing you can do is with an on trend or a seasonal product are, is miss those windows of opportunity because the next cycle is a very long ways away. And what's happening between that cycle? Could be nothing, could be some you know, improved product improvement. It could, it, what it is is actually delayed time, delayed revenue for you, okay? When we talk about seasonality or a one-time product or product extensions, <laughs> one of the really interesting ones, and I just saw a display in uh, recently on Elf on the Shelf. How many of you guys know what that is? Okay, so it started out as some little elf. I've never bought it or bought into the whole thing, but I get it. It's a little plush guy that, you know, moms and dads buy it, and it's kind of like a little threat. <laughs> they put it on the shelf, and... You know, it's, it's, it's Santa's helper, it's Santa's eyes and ears to kind of help kids, you know, stay in, you know, stay in check right before Christmas. And there are a lot of games and little strategies that go with that. People <coughs> don't, may have a lot of fun with it. But it started out as just this little plush with this kind of story that he's Santa's helper. Um, it has evolved into an entire product line. Uh, you know, movies, books, games, you know, clothing. I think there's going to be an animated video, uh, another animated video about it coming out soon. So, you know, here's, here's an idea that started out, you know, really small and has uh, grown exponentially through product extension. What was intended to be probably a one and done seasonal product, hey, if I sell a thousand of these or a hundred thousand of these every Christmas, great, has escalated across the board in so many different market opportunities and areas. So that is something that, you know, I encourage you to think about when it comes to your particular product that, that you're looking to commercialize because the reality is there's probably more op market opportunity than you initially realize. Certainly far, probably in this case, far beyond what that person initially thought. Now, you've done all of those heart, you've done all that preliminary work, you think that you're ready, you've got your checklist, I'm ready to start thinking about doing, uh, reaching out to a, a licensee. So, you know, who is or what is a licensee? 
Ask yourself that. Who, is, who do you envision partnering with and why? Come up with the whys. You might want to do kind of like a little pro and con checklist of why you think that they're the right licensee for you. And keep in mind, there's never just one. There's always an opportunity to, have to engage conversation with and even have contracts with more than one licensee. That's part of the strategic plan. But you really want to think about who your prospective licensees are. Um, what are their current products? How do they fit with what it is that you're trying to do? Is there that connection? Does it fit? Is it a piece of the puzzle or is it a total outlier? You absolutely don't want to do business with someone where it's a total outlier because you're, you're setting yourself up for some, some serious pitfalls, gaps. I'm not going to necessarily say failure because you still could have some success, but to get there is going to be a lot more work for, uh, for everyone involved because it's not an area that they're necessarily particularly familiar with or have expertise in. Um, where are their products currently sold and distributed? Again, because this connects to what you think that your plan is and where this fits. If they're only brick and mortar, but you want to do online, or they're only online and you want to do brick and mortar, whatever the case is, you want to make sure that you know, they have the model and they have the means to, to market and commercialize your product. And going back to that connection, that story, um, what do they understand about your product? You've got to make sure that you have helped them as much as you possibly can understand why your product, your brand is a good fit for them in their portfolio and that they want to be a partner with you as much, if not more, than you want to be their partner. Okay? Kind of make them beg for it a little bit if you can. Um, what are they when or how long will it take them to monetize the IP? Again, that leads to where they are, where their expertise is, what does their supply chain look like? Are we talking about licensing? I mean, excuse me, are we talking about manufacturing, distribution? How much of that um, concept to cr commercialization are they going to be involved in? How many other parties are involved in it? Um, what, what resources, whether it's R&D, tooling, marketing, sales, all those other areas, how, you know, how invested are they in those? Because those are going to determine how long it's going to help to get your, your intellectual property monetized, meaning you're making money. Okay? Um, and maximizing it. Again, you, it's difficult because in this space of Amazon, where they are the king of being able to sell anything and everything, that is such a unique opportunity because it is far different than anything else and anywhere else you will go. I think we all understand and we realize that. Because if you simply walk into a Walmart or a Petco or somewhere else where you've got a basically a warehouse or a large building that is, has lots of shelf space with lots of stuff on it, how is that really maximizing your, I, your, your IP potential, your revenue potential? You have a lot of stuff out there, but again, is it selling? Because if it's not selling, it's being discounted. If it's not selling, they aren't buying more. Okay? So you don't want to put yourself in a situation where, okay, yeah, I'm making a little bit of money, but is the goal to really make a little bit of money? Did you guys get into this to make a little bit of money? Mm -hmm. I, I, don't, I don't think so. I think you want to reach any maximization of your IP potential that you possibly can. And having the right licensee can help frame that for you. Um, again, going back to kind of that fit, right? Fitting in with the corporate strategy. What's their mission? A lot of companies, you know, like to put out a lot of mission statements, who we are about us, how do we feel about, you know, a particular um, cause or purpose or even a political environment. Right now, that's a very touchy subject. So you, you want to be careful about um, what their company image is, how they're, you know, communicating their image and their brand out into the market and make sure that that's not in any way going to interfere or be counterintuitive to what it is that you're trying to achieve. Um, one area that you really want to focus on is are they in this market already? Do they have patents in this same particular area? And, and what does that mean for you? Because are we talking about really a licensing deal? Are we talking about an outright purchase? What we're doing an assignment? So you really want to understand you know, what the framework for 
structuring the deal is right off the bat in those particular cases. You also want to be extra careful when you're going to have those initial discussions with them to not over disclose because if in fact they're already in that area, you don't want to give them any extra information so as to create you know, a potential issue for you in, in, in securing your patents if you haven't already, if you're still in the application phase. Um, or, and you certainly don't want to get into an area where then you get into a patent war with anyone because those are extraordinarily costly. Let's see. Uh, have they licensed their IP to anyone else or have they licensed anyone else's IP before? Is this their first rodeo? Is this their first time at the game? Because if they don't understand the game and you don't have a, a firm grasp, uh, you're, you're going to have a hard time being successful. You want to make sure that you, you're, you're picking a licensee who's been down this road before and having been down that road before, do they have or have had any issues with anyone else that they have licensed with in the past or currently licensed with? So you want to make sure you're not getting into an issue where you know, there's a non-compete or there's some sort of competitive issue between them and you and or another brand that they may be licensed with before, something didn't work out, there was a settlement or whatever the case may be and you want to make sure that, that that is known to you. You want to make sure that you understand what the nature and success of those prior relationships and or current relationships are. If in fact they have had problems and deals have had to be terminated in the past, hopefully they'll be somewhat honest with you about why those deals weren't successful. Um, because the worst thing you can do is, you know, that's like getting into a bad marriage from the start. Um, and I don't know how successful those have ever been. Uh, it's definitely not, a, not, a, not an area, not a path I would recommend. And how uh, do they manage, track, report, and pay on their existing licensing programs? The goal is to make sure that you get paid. You get paid timely. You get, fa you get paid fairly. You have the opportunity to audit and report and make sure that what, that what goes out the door and what comes into your wallet are, uh, you know, coincide with each other. So you want to make sure that they have the, the tools and the capability to connect and communicate with you as things progress so that you, again, stay successful. You want it because a big part of licensing, it's not a, I'm signing this agreement and I'm going to go sit on my couch and eat Doritos and get rich. It doesn't work that way. You put in as much time and investment in managing and maintaining this relationship as you would any other relationship in your life, personal or otherwise, because this is the way that you're protecting your intellectual property. It's still yours unless and until you assign it to them. We're not going to get into that today. So, you know, just like if you let someone borrow a car, you're not going to just let them take the keys and run and not ensure that they're maintaining the car, that they're not checking the tires every now and then, that they're not checking the oil level, that it's not running out of gas, all those other things that it's going to take to make sure that the car stays efficient. You want to make sure that your licensing deal stays efficient as well. So you are going to want to make sure that they have a successful program that you guys can work together to stay connected, stay communicated, and stay informed. Because if and when things start to go bad, you want to know about those things as quickly as possible before the deal is completely destroyed and done. Okay? It's, it's, it's just like in any other relationship. If things are going bad and nobody's talking and you're in the same room all the time and nobody's saying anything and just looking at each other with blank stares, I think eventually that's going to lead to a problem. Same thing here. You want to make sure that you're in constant communication, not badgering, not harassing, but staying in communication enough so you know things are progressing as they should according to the deadlines that you agreed to, according to milestones that you've agreed to, according to payments schedules that you've agreed to, because silence is going to kill your deal. Have there been any other disputes? You need to do your research on this. It's free. It's readily available. You can go out onto the USPTO website. You can even Google simply and, you know, Google, you know, litigation or infringement or, you know, uh, lawsuits with a particular company and you can find out how things have gone before. If they're not being readily, you know, apparent or transparent, excuse me, 
with you, you want to make sure that you go in prepared as well. Because even if something didn't go right, doesn't mean they still can't go right with you, but at least you want to come in armed with some of that information. You could say, hey, I understand you had a prior deal with, you know, so-and-so. Uh, looks like it didn't go well. It looks like maybe, you know, there was some sort of settlement. While I know you can't disclose the terms of the settlement, you know, what can you tell me about maybe what didn't go right and what can you do different in this deal with me where we're not going to have this same issue, you know, come up again. So make sure that you, you've done your essentially due diligence in, in that respect because, again, you don't want to get into a, a partnership or with a licensee where there have already been problems and these areas, infringement and validity, are, are killers in a deal. Okay. So, you know, it's critical to what I say be in the know. You know that old um, NBC hashtag, the more you know, ding, ding, ding. <laughs> kind of the same thing applies to you. Um, know your brand, know your product, know your story, know how it fits with your light, oh, typo there, licensee strategy. Um, know how it connects with the consumer, prepare your readiness checklist, have your IP strategic plan, and most importantly, do not approach a licensee if you do not have these things done first. You are far too premature. Any opportunity that you had will most likely be lost because they're not going to be patient and they're not going to wait for you to get your act together. If you don't, then, then you will lose that opportunity. And when that door closes, it's hard to, to get that door reopened again. The likelihood is very difficult. It's, it's slim to none in, that, in those particular cases. So I'm going to leave that here and see if you guys have any questions. No questions. You well, guys got it all together? Kind of Go ahead. Question, isn't it true? Really misnomer. Many people think, well, I'm going to get the license agreement and the lab first. That company is going to figure out all the rest of these things for me. I'll just get the check. Let me know. Yeah, you can't sign. You cannot go to a licensee, knock on their door. Hey, give me an agreement. They give you their boiler template agreement that is obviously to their advantage. And they're going to figure everything out for you. And you're just going to, like I said, sit back on the couch, binge Netflix all night, and eat Doritos until you're rich. It's not going to happen. So they're not going to figure everything out for you. They're not going to do any everything for you. You have to work together. It's a collaboration. You know, they're going to they're going to do the heavy lifting in terms of, you know, depending on how what your deal is, you know, consists of. But, you know, they don't have all the answers for you. Um, they'll have the answers they want to give you. But, you know, you ask a 5-year-old if they're, you know, if they want, you know, broccoli or pizza, they're going to pick pizza, you know, most of the time you, when you really want them to eat broccoli. And so maybe a bad analogy or not, but again, you, you have to be prepared to, you know, know what's best for you, what's best for your product, and, and establish that right up front with your, your licensee. Yep. So, you have, go ahead. Go ahead. so how do you know, uh, you know, how much money and time you should put into yours and on licensing because they, you know, the big companies have their own departments for everything that they want. So they would probably want to, you know, use their team to design it. But how can you do it? So how far down the commercialization path should you go before you work with a licensee? So you're saying it's, it's mm -hmm. I mean, it's better to, to go all the way through to the final product before you go. Not necessarily, no. How do you know? How do you know? Like, if I put in money with the designer and come to try to come up with it, and then you go to a licensee and they want to change the around it. Well, well, some license, yeah. So some licensees are generally gonna, you know, might ask for, well, do you have a prototype? Is it a working prototype? Do you, they want to see some viability in terms of what it does. You know, it, you can't really see what something does in in a patent application. You see all the steps and you see all the perspectives and all that other stuff, but how something works is, is kind of tangible, right? So, you know, if you, you know, in, in cases where you're, you're talking about something physical, you know, if you can get to the point where you have at least some model or some prototype for, for demonstrable purposes, that's obviously an advantage to you.
do you have to have gone and, and, and gotten a manufacturer and gotten all the tooling and, and have a, a near ready commercial product available? No, you don't, not in a licensing deal. Um, that could be different if the licensee is not also your manufacturer, that's a different topic of discussion. But no, you don't have to be down that far down that path, you just have to have something where they, they get it. Um, because if, if they in fact are going to take over and one of the license rights is for them to manufacture, excuse me, they may use a different tooling, they may use a different method, they may use a different manufacturing process, so that would be wasted money on your effort to, to be able to do that, so. Yep. Leslie, yep. do you, shouldn't you have an agreement on who's going to do the advertising and you should have input on how the products is advertised? That's all part of your licensing deal. Yeah. Yep. So in, in your licensing deal, advertising, marketing is a big part of it. There could be marketing funds set aside where you know you contribute or they hold back part of your a percentage of your royalty or an amount that's part of your royalty towards you know co-funding of the, you know the marketing. They'll put in some marketing. You'll put in a little bit. Maybe they put in ten thousand. Maybe for every thousand you put in, maybe they'll put ten thousand. There's no specific formula, right? Um, but yeah, marketing is a big part of your licensing deal because without marketing, you're not going to be successful. Things just don't, things really don't sell themselves, right? And, and so yeah, part of your licensing deal is understanding what the plan is for advertising and promotion, yeah. how much, how often, and what are those mediums? Because the other part of that is, is you could, you could have a licensee that's investing a ton of money in marketing and advertising, but it can be ineffective because it's not doing what it's intended to do. It's not hitting the right markets. It's um, not getting to the shelf. Pardon? It's not getting on the shelf. It, uh, there is getting, it either is or isn't getting on the shelf, but yeah. it's not just whether it gets on the shelf. It's got to move off the shelf. Right. Right? And, and so, yeah, uh, licensing isn't just about, hey, how do I make money off of this? There's the, again, there's a whole broad of steps involved. It's not just about how much I'm going to get paid, when I'm going to get paid and whether it looks like a dollar or a percent sign. All of those steps are involved from concept to commercialization. How are you going to get it there all those steps away? Manufacturing, distribution, marketing, promotion, and a whole host of other things. Again, I don't want to get into that topic tonight because a lot of the information is available already. <coughs> Leslie, you to brought up a myriad of points that have to be considered and thought out. Do you still offer your spreadsheet with the list of these things? That have to be considered, or is this uh, on your website, or how can people find out, the, go, go back to these points and address them? Yeah, so I do have my IP readiness checklist that as a client, we sit down and we go through that. Um, it's, a, it's the kind of like the near preliminary discussion that we have, uh, because until you have that completed, I can't work with you. I, it, there are too many open, unanswered questions and so it, it's a document that I've created uh, it just asks you a ton of questions somewhat related to this some go far more into the next couple of steps but unless and until you have that ready I, 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 I just can't really work with you but yes I do make it available but on a client basis it's not posted okay. anymore thank you I'll get to you in a minute Ruth uh, do you have any general advice for this situation um, so my product, Sipsi, made in USA, we're very, it's very important to us to ensure that anything with the Sipsi name on it is made in USA. If there are licensees interested in uh, manufacturing a, the product that's covered by my intellectual property um, overseas, you know, I'm saying that I'm interested in having that conversation but the Sipsi name has to come off of it. Like, do you have any sort of thoughts or advice on how to proceed with the, what things I should look out for, do not do? Well, y yes, you could do one thing, which is say, no, I, I, you know, part of your license deal is that the product is manufactured within the U.S. It's going to narrow, you know, your 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 you know manufacturing capabilities, unfortunately, because manufacturing in the U.S. versus overseas right. costs and all of that. That's something you have to work through with your prospective licensee. But what you could do is sell it as a secondary brand or off-brand, right? And right. so they, you, you could offer them the rights to, to that, you know, that intellectual property for them to produce a, a non-SIPSI branded product right. that 
may do the exact same thing or may do something totally different. But that's called territorial aspects of the licensing. So where they sell, how they sell it, how they market it, those are secondary aspects to your licensing deal. So yeah, it's possible. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Yep, Bruce. So my question is, um, uh, so if you have a working prototype, you have the provisional patent and you have copyrights on that prototype, uh, basically you have all the legal protections. Would that, um, uh, like if I, I'm thinking of approaching this, this, this place and showing them my, my, my prototype, is that a good idea or should I wait until I hear some, something from the USPTO in case I get uh, uh, approved for the non-provisional? I mean, um, I mean, I don't, I don't. While, while your patent is in the application process or, or the prosecution process, if you will, Things can change. You know, you're going to get office. You're going to get office actions. You're going to get rejections. You're going to have to go back to the board, drawing board, and, and and go back. You know, more than one time. So those things are going to happen. Um, what you want to do is is even though you've got some level of protection once you filed your application, what you never want to do is go to a prospective licensee and, and show them everything step by step how to do it, all the materials that you used, all the manufacturing, all the things that you thought of. You don't want to give them an open step by step opportunity to you know, cut you off at the knees or work around you while you're still in that process. Um, so I would, be, you know, I would show enough, but not too much. <laughs> Think of it as a first date. Show enough, <laughs> say enough, but not too much. Don't go all the way. <laughs> But you are free to operate. Now, now that you yeah. have filed, you are free to contact people because yeah. you do have a level of protection. Perception yeah. of ownership is... Right. Right. Just like I said, just, just show and discuss only what you need in order to secure the licensing deal. So don't show the prototype? No, you can show the prototype. But don't tell them everything about how it's made or where it's made or... Oh, okay, okay. Mm -hmm. well, yeah. Yeah. And so do you, like, if I want to meet with you, do you, I mean, do you do that? Do you, uh, do I do what? Like, can I meet with you and see about, um, you know, like, on a licensing deal? Mm -hmm. Like, mm -hmm. based on the fact that someone already, couple companies already contact me, but. As long as you have some of these other steps done first. If, if these other steps aren't done first, I, I can, so here, here's my thing. I, I am. Completely honest, completely transparent, and as black and white as you're going to get. And my goal is not to sit here and spend hours and hours and hours walking through every step, every nuance. I can do that, and I can sit back and I can start making money. Crazy. But that's not what I want to do. I want to provide you with the tools, the information, the right level of help to get you where you need to go because that's what's important to me. Not sitting here and dragging on and dragging things on and, and billing you hourly and, and I don't get joy out of that. I don't, so I, don't derive, I don't derive anything of personal. Someone who's like me, I think trying to get all those steps down, but I get stuck on something. And that's fine. As long as you've, you've, you've shown, you've demonstrated, you know, understanding, capability, knowledge about, you know, all these things that I've discussed tonight, all the things in my prior videos, if you have all of that awareness and understanding and then you come to the table and say, here's everything I have, we'll go through that. And anything that's missing or not there or, we, or not clear, that's a good starting point. But starting from, you know, scratch or, you know, ditch level, it's, it's, it's too much effort for me, quite, to be on, quite honest. Leslie isn't going to go out and make the connections for you either. Yeah, no. This is, uh, I, I've had great success working with Leslie personally in, in the past, uh, but it was after a year and a half of actually going to trade shows, getting the marketing results, knowing uh, and actually making an association with a company uh, that we grew and it actually turned into a memo of understanding. We've been through, we went through enough meetings where we had a basic framework of what we thought our agreement should and could be. And it, it wasn't until then that we approached Leslie to come in and help us figure out you know how to do this correctly and, and, and protect our side of it as, as much as we could which worked out quite well so but it took quite a bit of getting ready and prepared those that's not Leslie's job yeah I, I just I, I can I just I just don't want to <laughs> Eric yeah. this is the last question love, by the way. Uh, it's not really a question but what I love about Leslie's um, information is 
the licensee or potential licensee is, is investing more than just the product. Mm -hmm. They are investing into you, the expert, expert in that area. Mm -hmm. And I have found that often the case is that, that your product might even be skipped on, but they, are, they want you involved, and so you're able to offer other products and other ideas. Yeah, it's, if you're a rock it's, star, it's they really, want to work I with mean, you. It's, this stuff is so, this is great. Thank I, you. I don't want to skip Andrew. He's yeah. got a question. Yeah, I, I, I've kind of got, gone through your, your checkoff list. I, I, I think I'm, I'm pretty much there. Uh, my ultimate goal is to, to work with uh, Disney Accelerator. Have you heard of Disney Accelerator? Mm -hmm. uh, so it kind of cut, ties into with Dave's question. Uh, I, have, I have the utility patent. Uh, I have the prototype. I'm almost at uh, manufacturing, but just saying don't show too much. They might. They might say, like, you know what, I like the product, but I like to tweak it a little bit. I've already spent money on, on tooling. And then, so, um, you know, my question is, have, have you worked with Disney Accelerator? And at this point, I mean, it's kind of gray, or I, I'm just kind of mm -hmm. for right now, but ha is Disney Accelerator, um, are they friendly, you know, with working with people? I've not personally worked with them under this new platform that they're doing. Um, you know, one thing that you can do is um, Disney's pulled out of a lot of you know mass trade shows and you know mass industry you know um, uh, product line invention kind of things, different segments um, because they're kind of creating their own little universe around all of those things. Um, so I, when was the last time I worked with them? Gosh, I couldn't even tell, ten, mm, more than 10 years ago, 15 years? Yeah. So, um, it's not to say I can't, not to say that I wouldn't, um, but I'm not familiar with the new program that, that, that they're running now. Um, in terms of Disney overall, I mean, they wouldn't be as successful if they weren't amenable to working with people. I mean, can, you can walk out your front door and see Disney on practically anything these days. So, you know, they are open to, you know, certainly, you know, expanding their, their products and product lines, uh, you know, on a global basis. Um, taking, but, you know, again, they're, they're not looking to take on products. What they're, t what, they're, what they're offering you is the opportunity to license their brands, their characters and names. So, we'll you know, you know yeah. that's, that's kind of the angle that you, you have to think about a different mindset with them, is they're really more on the outbound licensing side of things than really the, the inbound, unless you have a really cool, unique new character or something that they can monetize, you know, but for the most part, they're not really, uh, you know, as far as I know, they're not looking really to do um, inbound licensing for product to product development. They're more there. If people want to actually put a Disney character on their product, that's then they'll work a license agreement. Yeah, I, 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 basically I want their Disney pot, their you know, Superman, character. Batman, you know, all their stuff, yeah. Mickey Mouse on my product, oh. yeah. put them on their shelves. Oh, you know, okay. Yeah, so they, they yeah. actually have brokers that kind of facilitate that for them too and, and, and also in different market segments. So in most cases, you're probably not even going to work with Disney Direct to get to obtain those license deals. You're going to work through one of their, their license reps or one of their brokers. Um, I can get you some information on, on some of that. Um, again, they're not participating in you know, a lot of the more mainstream um, you know, industry you know, things like licensing. They're, they have their own thing now. They don't even come to the licensing events anymore. Um, but I huh. should, I should still be able to have some contact information for you on that. I have to do some digging. Okay, I would, I would, I would think that they would recommend perhaps manufacturers that they work with if they like the product. It's something you know they would, one of their yeah. manufacturers that they have a relationship with. Yeah. Right. Right. There's a matchmaker service that does that as well. Mm that matches, you know, you to different brands, to different brokers that they know that they're already, is you know, dealing party? with. It's party? a third
How about that box? Yeah. That's even better. <laughs> like I said, just short little stories. The first story we're going to start with is the youngest U.S. Pat, older. Six-year-old Robert Patch um, invented a little toy uh, truck that could turn into a dump truck or a flatbed truck. He used Ted's shoe boxes. Everybody remember Ted's? Some of us who are old enough to remember. Uh, file caps and nails. That was his prototype. He actually got a patent of it on it. And when he received his patent, he wasn't even able to sign his name, so he signed the patent application with an X. That's what helped make him famous. Got his articles in the paper. His only compensation from this was Keds saw an article and set him a new box with a new pair of shoes. Yeah. Our second story, everybody remember the pet rock? Yes. Back in 1975, Gary was talking to his friends in a bar in, uh, uh, up northern California, Santa Cruz, and he was listening to them uh, disdain about their pets and all the work that was involved with it. Gary was like, well, let's see if I can do something else. And he came up with the idea with a pet rock. His marketing approach was simple. You don't feed them, you don't mess the clean up, they nothing to worry about listening, they won't die, they won't become sick, you don't need to bathe them or groom them or anything. They would be the perfect pet. So he went out and made it happen. Uh, 1975, in April, he started the invention. By the Christmas season, he sold over a million of these at $3.95. Became a millionaire. Which I looked at three ninety five in today's dollars to seventeen dollars. That's uh, that's, that's what you Thank you for that. Just that this morning. Actually, they sell them on Amazon replicas, replicas for that price. Yeah. I, I have one of the originals. Why don't I? I mistakenly bought one of the ones on Amazon. Oh, is it replica? And, and I returned it, returned it because I wanted the original one. Cape Rock. <laughs> Modern current rock. <laughs> <laughs> hey, yeah. Let's go to the modern current rock. Uh -oh. Nordstrom's came out with a wrapped stone, leather wrapped stone, sold it for $85 and sold out. So they came up with a little bit less expensive one, $65, and that too sold out. All because of Gary and his pet rock. That's what started with them. Our next segment is space. Starting to hear about this on the news, it's now going to become the next big innovation. And the reason being there are four key players to the space program. And because of that, the space race is back on. The four key players, the first one is SpaceX. This is your uh, uh, capital last name. Sorry about that. But Tesla, he is very involved in the space program. He uh, was just awarded a $130 million defense contract to launch satellites. The next one is Blue Origin, Amazon. Um, he's aiming to sell commercial flight next year. That's how aggressive he is. And uh, SpaceX and Blue Origin are basically competing each against each other. This is what's going to drive the competition in the space program. The third one is space flight. The Seattle, uh, Washington-based company who just signed a mem memorandum, and they're going to work with Virgin Orbit. And they're going to be, uh, they've already launched all uh, satellites, and they're going to be, as well, more aggressive in the low, what they call low Earth orbit, uh, launching of satellites starting next year. The fourth player, our current administration. Uh, he is very uh, uh, forward-thinking on taking NASA and developing and getting Congress to fund it, become a major player in the space program again. So these four key players will bring on our next space race, but it won't all be done by the government. And this is just the United States. This is also going to 
create a, a drive for all these other countries. And don't forget China. They will be involved. And a lot of people ask, why the space race? What would we get for the space race? Uh, one thing that we have done in the past is NASA was very uh, forward thinking. They wanted to take ideas and of everything they developed and spin it off into other commercial products. You had the right as a citizen to go to NASA if you saw something you liked and you could go in and request that product and you could go use it. They wanted to have you do that to go out and start businesses and then create jobs. And that's why uh, technologies have been created because of what was done. That says over 6,300 patents to the name. And you have the right to go and look at these and take a look at them. If you see something you like, develop it into more product. You can license it. They offer licenses in the STTR department because that's what they're there for. Is transferring license agreements from things that were developed by NASA to be used to commercialize. Because NASA is for the people. It's, it's not... Is your money in the first place? Exactly. They use your money to develop. What have we got for the space program in the last 20 or 30 years? Super Soaker. Believe it or not, it was developed by one of the engineers and it's probably the, one of the number one selling toys even to this day. Right. Memory foam. I'm oh, sorry? The blue in the end of the wall? Yeah, right? I don't remember the name. Memory foam. Insulation. Uh, physical braces. Scratch resistant lenses, which I don't wear, unfortunately. Um, insulin pumps. Infrared ear thermometers. Solar energy. Artificial limbs, and of course, an abundance of programming that they have created and developed. And some of it was used in the for weather. So a lot of these weather channels are be, have been using NASA's programming for 40, 50 years now. And what's going to happen in the next 20, 25 years with space and the spin-offs? It's going to be exciting. That's our segment for insignificant, significant. Thank you for today. Oh, wow. Okay. Adrian, I'll return the podium to you. Oh, boy. Awesome. Thanks, Tom. Look forward to the next one's segment. Yeah. You're going to get some new things. All right, even more? Absolutely. Well, that sounds great. You might mention the cheetah. Yeah. Yes, it does. There's so many. Black is America's great. Exactly. Okay. Uh, I'm going to get us out of here a little bit after nine, so I'll go through this pretty quick. There's not much money in here in resources and opportunities. Uh, what I do like every month is share if there's any new stories and new resources. But here's a quick picture. You guys, I'm going to go through this quick. If you see something, you know, we're recording it, and we're going to come back to you later, and I'll pull it out and send it to you seven star. Okay? So, that said, there's resources and opportunities. Um, our newsletter. Uh, I put a lot of effort into this one. It's so chock full of stuff. I need a copy to, uh, to share and show you. So, um, this uh, newsletter this month, we talked about uh, having Leslie back and speaking. We talked about uh, something I'm going to share with you in a minute about this new movie premiere that will be here in just a couple of weeks. I shared with you a letter from Randy Landemir who's talking about this new bill that's been presented now. It's HR 6557. And uh, I've got information here to share with you on that. But the idea here is we are now looking at three bills in Congress to help invent this first time in history. Also in the newsletter was that next month's inventor uh, speaker is Cindy Key. I mentioned about a maker fair. We have to decide still if we're going to go there. I think we will. Uh, I mentioned in here that there's a quick pitch at uh, Qualcomm here, which is the well-known quick pitch competition for two minutes. You get in front of the Texas Angels and get them interested. Two minutes. You can do it. You can do it every year. It's really fun. Uh, Quirky is back. Quirky was a group led by inventors, former inventors. It went down, it's back up. And the leader is Rula Kukuia and Gina Wallenhorn. And fantastic job, great operation, and it's back on track to uh, make 
invention accessible again. So uh, we're, we're really happy to see that Inventors Launch Academy uh, the Porky become the great place for you to actually put and launch your products. Okay. We have a list, our, our friend Maggie supplied this. It's an A to Z of corporate innovation labs, 73 innovation labs that do cover everything technology, telecommunication, finance, retail, auto, health, media, consulting, insurance, energy, travel, industry. This is all, these are all innovation labs. These are the biggest companies from ATT to Xerox. The list and the link is here in the newsletter, okay? Um, meet this, who's talking about? <laughs> Okay, so we were really happy to introduce you. I'm really glad you're here and thank you for your help and contribution to talk really good. Um, uh, Danny, you're mentioned here in the newsletter too. We appreciate your help. We thank you. We want to promote you. Anybody that needs to help audiovisual, you have a technical issue that you need solving. Uh, Danny is an uh, electrical engineer uh, and an Navy expert here, a musician, a man of many talents. So I feel like he's plugging you too. I mentioned the IGA, the Inventors Group of America, and how proud we were to get it together, and I'll explain that this morning. There's a slide on that. Um, tidbits. Remember a couple months ago, uh, Dave and his family were here, and they were showing that news, uh, I think it was a copy of that here. They, they, they've got a, a, a newsletter now, and uh, it's a, uh, available now. It's a freebie, but it's like a paper, and it's being found now in Comencius uh, Escondido. And it's so cool, I come in there and see our little ads in there, and it's just a great way of seeing that even in today's day and age, you can create a new publication, get it out there, and get sponsors, and create a whole business. And I salute you, David, and congratulations. Uh, the link to that is in here as well. Uh, so, you know, there's a lot of good things in this month's newsletter, and if you don't have a subscription to the newsletter, well, sign up. The sign up sheet's out there, and I'd be happy to put you on that newsletter list, okay? Um, and there's the link for this month's newsletter. Uh, many resources, I'm happy to be a resource that many, many of you have come to my office for an hour for free. I'll figure out where you're trying to go, where you're at, and how we can help you get there. Uh, I do it in a very uh, simple process. I actually give you the notes at the end of the meeting, talking to you about the steps and trying to figure out, again, where you're at and why there's a process to all of this. So I'm happy to go over that with you and, again, leave the notes when you leave so you can remember what we're talking about. Um, I also give you for free, I have a copy of the tube here. Here's a matrix before you get started in your projects, how to be objective and score your idea and make sure it's worth developing. I love when people come in with a whole bucket of stuff and they say, well, use this, go through the process, and you take your best scoring items. That's where you can start. And there's CD, another bigger resource. Many other resources. Uh, there are incubators, um, there's other clubs to help, uh, and we'll help you with Eric Club for women. Uh, EO Nexus is an incubator for high-tech startups. There's a couple of them. The uh, Sandy Sports Innovators, Bill Walton, the Express Soul Player runs that. They have a great program for helping people develop new sport products. Um, and a few other good maker places. Maybe you just need a hobby shop uh, to build something yourself in your space, but one day you want to use tools, they've got all the latest tools. They'll even teach you how to use them. So it becomes a really great place to you build I'm really glad that the Google for San Diego Innovation and Incubators were actually on this list as the uh, uh, San Diego Energy. So if you don't your resources. And we do like to link to the other groups as well. Parallabs is great. Uh, score, you probably know, they're still around. So it's total prior to They'll help you get your business plans started. His name is Axion. Look that screen, though, isn't it? Anyway. Um, this slide is about uh, Amazon. Yeah, watch cat, like we mentioned earlier. They want to ship and sell products, so they love to help you get your product market. Uh, the, the next thing in the resource, if you're interested in innovation, because you haven't really invented something, but you want to make something better, there's a process of doing that. And this gentleman's quite the expert in the TEDx talk that I just love bragging about. And he tells the story about having invented the Swiffer. He'd never mocked before in his life. He spent months watching other people, asking them questions, seeing what their pain was, then creating ideas, and having them tested in the evolution, and finally ended up being the Swiffer. It's a wonderful video to watch, showing you what the, uh, the process is, and with enough passion in the right parts, you can reinvent anything. 
success happens. People find you, uh, your report, Dan, you had a young couple here that uh, had created a pie section so you make a pie inside a pie. And at the same show, it was, uh, what was the TV name? It doesn't matter, there was a newscaster who went by with a film crew and she saw it and she went, mm, stop, stop the section and she just pulled over there and gave him a pie. And it got her neck, it got his neck, I think, you know, he's trying to pull you up some trade shows. The United Events Association is uh, really pretty great. But you guys come first. So this is your chance now. Any of you are looking for any specific kind of vendor or help or assistance? <coughs> Here, I'll do some electronics for you, or I can share with you what Michelle does. Uh, and uh, we'd like to relate to the people and refer people that we trust. It's our reputation to refer these names, so it's only after 30 years that we do feel safe with a, a, a number of great companies. So we're happy to refer them. Any of you looking for that connection right now? Yeah, two, okay, great. Let's, yes, no, 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 no. someone that can uh, make a plastic. Um, like putting cutting and gluing well, I had a, I had one or a couple made out of 3D printing, but uh -huh. it didn't seem to have the rigidity I needed for the function problem. Well, this one's easy. Robert right here is a really great mechanical engineer, and he's got the tools, and he's got the experience, and I'm sure you go to so, talk to Robert. Okay. Who else? Yeah, I don't know. George uh, moved to an so I'm going to have to do Oh, well, uh, Dave. Danny doing the videos and 
help the technical issues. Uh, I've had him come in to work for us at East Square, does an amazing job. He can help you, like, you know, he's called, what was it, Geek Squad? They come in and help you set up your computers and stuff. What's that? I'm my own private Geek Squad. Oh. <laughs> uh, so, and myself, uh, we do run a shop for some lady for years, make electronics and put them in the packages and put them tested and shipped. So, uh, that's, that's my part.
they actually they actually prosecute people that infringe. They no longer have this. I mean, it used to be yeah, that it is not being everybody off. There's still issues there, but now the government of China is on the side of the inventors. They know that's where innovation comes from, and that's why they're now leading the world in so many areas. So much investment money now is going to China because guess what? Artificial intelligence is software based. Again, you can't have that here in the U.S. So where are they going? China. Okay. The other thing about the petition was uh, the abstract ideas. That's just crazy. Uh, injunctive relief means, uh, you know, can I sue somebody for infringing on you? So you could. Well, the new laws now say that if you're not producing more than the person infringing on you, it's for the public benefit that you let the infringer stay in business. And they'll force you to solve, uh, settle for a license deal that's less than market value. It absolutely is ridiculous that we're giving the benefit to the corporations. And now the terminology is called efficient infringement. And that means that a big company is more cost effective for them to just knock you out and knock you off than to develop it themselves. So we have to restore our injunctive relief laws so we can't even see people now from the country. First to file, first to invent. This was uh, the reason the whole thing was uh, covered up with the start saying that uh, the rest of the world is the first person to file. Well, I this year, for the first time in 30 years, had four of you that came to my office and you wrote down in tears crying and didn't want to admit it because you were afraid I was going to steal your idea. Because yes, somebody unscrupulous, if you talk to somebody without having any protection, if they're unscrupulous, they can go to a computer for $65, register the idea, and if they did it before you did, they own your idea. So you're talking to somebody and they go, man, that doesn't make sense, get out of here. They go to the computer and they own it. That's what the first to file laws have enabled. First inventor. So you know, we decided we needed a petition to start a movement. We had a few thousand signatures. How did we get the signatures? I was actually able to get the main groups in this country united, realizing that we're all going to be out of business if we don't start standing up. And in fact, uh, a couple of took the lead here, like Stephen Key and Warren Tuttle, uh, the heads of these big organizations that went national, and they decided, let's work together. So we started working together in supporting uh, this petition. Um, our group, it was really just three of us. It was Randy, Paul, and, and uh, we're thinking, we got to make more news. Nobody knows about this. We all know about the Kardashians and every other movie star is a problem, but gosh, what's really changing this country, nobody knows. Well, we made a demonstration, had a couple dozen inventors show up, and we burned our patents right in front of patent office. Because the point was, these are liabilities. Let's go back to that. If you have a patent and a company wants to infringe on you, they put you through a process for only $20,000, and you now owe, you have to come up with $50,000. Tell me that isn't a liability. It's only the patent is a liability now, unless you're in a full business or have a great license agreement with the corporates. So we were showing the value of these patents are now just ashes, and the entire industry has tanked, and the trillions of dollars of equity in this country used to own in patents has been destroyed because of these patent laws. We had a little news coverage about it, most of it was international. Uh, we really had our uh, thoughts and hopes that the Supreme Court was going to stand up and, and, and back us on the idea that patents are property rights. This big case came to the oil states versus green energy. Case about fracking technology, green energy, French, uh, oil states sued, green energy came back and put them through this process, took it all the Supreme Court. Uh, we went, we protested, we showed the banners that uh, you know, the patent office has been the greatest job creator in the history of mankind. We need these laws preserved, we need people have the rights, and we made all the noise we could and, and wrote letters to the Supreme Court uh, from experts and uh, U.S. inventor uh, started thinking about another bill and uh, started promoting it, the U.S. Inventor Act, which I'll get to in a minute. Uh, we went this year to D.C. and we're dealing with Congress now in the panel. Remember, there's division, so Supreme Court's one thing, they were given a case. Uh, Congress has enacted and able these laws that are horrible. We're trying to get them to understand the damages and reverse them. And then there's working with the patent office itself. So our little group, USI, we went back first as three people, then we got 10 people. Uh, and then we were able to, uh, with the help of UIA uh, and the US inventor and the inventors groups of America, we showed up and had a big conference there. And we actually had 40 club leaders now involved nationally. 
We've all united and joined together. And we had a conference at the patent office. We had the director there. We had the assistant director. And they are almost in tears admitting that this is really messed up. They really understand the, the problems we created in the last administration. And the new director who took over was actually almost talking to our hearts. He really understood the issues and problems. He is an inventor himself. He is an examiner himself. And this is a whole different world. The previous director from the previous administration was the ex-head of Google. Tell me that isn't a conflict of interest. But she ran that department. She used, she, she tried to get allocations of 700 million to make the PTAB division even bigger. She was trying to make the department of the patent office that takes away patents bigger than the actual patent department. She was trying to appropriate money that over 100 million is supposed to be a significant amount, and the 700 million she never filed is a significant amount. Anyway, Michelle Lee did just a great job, and we're happy she was gone. Uh, after the administration's change, if she stepped down like she was supposed to, you know, she stood on for like four months. Anyway, now we have this gentleman named uh, Ayanku, and he's our hero, and we wish him the best, and we support him wholeheartedly, but I don't know how much you can do that fast. You know? Well, this was us. We showed up. We made our waves. Thank you, Eric, and Rosa, for joining me there. Uh, and uh, we actually, um, so on the first day we brought the panel office, the second day we swarmed Capitol Hill and we went to, I don't know, 40 different congressmen's offices and tried to inform them and enlighten them. And we've been having success. Uh, we're getting them understand things, we're getting them interested in things. So, in fact, there are now three bills that are coming out. One is a whitewash because it's the stronger Patent Act that's backed up by all the corporations and they don't want to see the major changes, so it does not include getting rid of PTAPs. The other bill that's out there has a very long name, but it's Congressman Macy's bill, uh, and it does, in fact, get rid of PTAPs. And the third bill is the one the USI is now just introduces, HR 6557, gets rid of PTAP entirely. I'll show you that. So yeah, this whole law from the Supreme Court finally got decided on after these meetings. We were just devastated. I know people just thrown in the towel, they moved to China, Paul's gone. Yeah, that would be cool. um, I'm not finally here anymore. I know a lot of people. It's just this is the end of the patent world for Americans. Or it's not, depending on how much you act and how much interest you have and how active you become. Okay? Uh, so here's what's happening. Um, when we were back there, there was some video crews, and they videotaped a bunch of us saying our case and our says, and they put it together collectively as a movie. We have flyers over right here, there's a connection in the newsletter, there's flyers out there, and you are all invited. This will be right here in this theater on the 21st, and uh, this is a movie basically about Josh Malone. Josh Malone invented the uh, balloons, uh, Bunch of balloons, that's the most popular product right now, toy product. Uh, go to Costco and that's the big pallets full of it. Uh, as a father of eight kids, uh, he wanted a fast way to make water balloons fill up and, uh, and did so. Went to Kickstarter, the campaign exploded on him, and sure enough, a company called Telegram saw that it exploded on him and knocked him off. Decided to, right the very first day they saw the ad for the Kickstarter to go out the window. Um, so when it all comes to market, uh, Telegrams comes out with a, a copy, it wasn't just a copy, they took his product, sprayed a balloon, and went, look what we made, it is for you. So uh, he starts going to war with them, and they went back and forth, and this became the poster boy of what's wrong with that system. He's now spent over $20 million, I forget how many court cases he's gone through in federal court, and the patent PTAB department saying, no, we shouldn't have the patent. What does it all come down to? The terminology, substantially. He used the word, my balloons are substantially filled. And the other company had the audacity to say that isn't descriptive enough. And they've been bad, and this is a $20 million fight. But Josh Malone will be here on the 21st to tell you all about it. Uh, it's finally been turning around for him, and he has been winning some of these, uh, these lawsuits. So it's a great, amazing story on persistence. But really what is the root and core of it is the whole damage and destruction that the American Event Act is, caused, is causing, will cause, has caused, this is just, Easy fix. So yeah, I'm in it three or four times because you know I can talk like this. And, uh, but the rest of the story is about Paul. Uh, excuse me, about Josh and this case in point, and another inventor who's actually got a much more technical uh, innovation and invention, and uh, has, has been facing these challenges. 
Uh, it also then interviews a number of other congressmen, senators. Uh, so please come. It's free. Uh, I don't know about food, but the movie's free and the parking's free. And the information you need to know, and I hope you share it and make other people aware of it, okay? Because uh, it's always I've been a great country uh, to succeed in. And we want to keep it that way because the benefits are to all of us as a society. All right? Again, I thank you very much for your concern, your interest, and I hope it's your participation too, okay? Uh, thanks again, Aiden Healthcare. Uh, again, I'm able to uh, come talk to you. I've actually created a product development plan. Uh, we can sit down and show you how to go from concept to market ready. Uh, there is a spreadsheet for it. And I look forward to seeing you on the 21st, and then again next month once the is here. All right, guys? Have a good day. Don't forget to grab one of these magazines if you like. The flyer here is over the list of what's the schedule for the sponsor sheet if you think you can find or want to be a sponsor. And don't forget to grab one of these flyers for movie. Sure, we know what you need. I want to put this is uh, what I have Another one in the can, right, Danny? Sure. Um, I actually organized it around lunch. So I first did the leather.